Hello, and welcome to the Savvy Safety Sisters Partner and Prevention Podcast. I'm your host, Carrie Pascrello of Global Secure Resources. And this month, we want to celebrate International Women's Day and Women's History Month with the goal of spotlighting amazing women changing the course of the world with their actions, their thoughts, and their hopes for a better and safer future. And so today, I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Angie Fiege. Dr. Fiege is an emergency medicine, critical care, trauma ICU physician, the medical director of NASCAR's American Medical Response Safety Team, and the mother to Rachel, who after a catastrophic event, lost her life the first week at college. Now, Dr. Fiege, started a program called Rachel's First Week, dedicated to protecting the vulnerable lives of teens as they transition to adulthood. Now, she shares heartache with thousands of young people each year with the hopes of changing the fate of just one student. Welcome, Dr. Fish. We're so honored to have you today. Thank you for having me, and thank you for uh, championing our cause by putting it out there. You got it. Now, today in celebrating International Women's Day, I want to ask you, my first question to you is, who was the most influential woman in your early life that inspired you? I have to say my mom. She was amazing. I think the thing that she taught me more than anything else was grace. She was the most kind, forgiving, understanding person on the face of the earth. And um, I th- that really, with her uh behavior and her way of handling people really instilled a lot of uh, my current thoughts on how I manage life and manage others. So she's an amazing woman. And I think even though it's not necessarily my younger years, I would have to say Rachel probably influenced me as much as anybody. She uh, has made me a better person in her absence. So Wow. Remarkable women in your life. So I think that just segues right into, can you share a little bit about Rachel and her, the inspiration behind Rachel's first week? Um, Well, Rachel is my daughter. Um, She was an amazing young lady. Uh, A lot like my mom, actually. She was one of those kids that uh, would take any student that she was with and bring them into her group. She was very caring, understanding, uh, very smart, witty, funny, amazing young, young lady. So her story actually begins um, her senior year of high school into her freshman year of college. She went to Indiana University with the hopes of becoming a nurse. Um, she had been on campus for about 48 hours and went with some of her high school friends to an off-campus party that was being hosted by other students that went to her high, same high school. Um, and you know how these old off-campus houses are on college campuses. They're often old and rickety. And she was going down a flight of stairs and tripped and fell and and hit her head. Um, Afterwards, she was sort of dazed and the people at the party had her lay down on the sofa. Um, They went on with their activities. And then later in the night, they went to check on her and she wouldn't wake up. And then they noticed she was blue. So they called 911. Um, By the time the medics got there, she was in cardiac arrest. Uh, She was transported to the local hospital there. They were able to resuscitate her, uh, but ultimately, you know, within half a day, she died from her traumatic brain injury. Um, She did go on to organ donation. um, So part of her still survives and a young man that we are very close to. Um, But that's sort of Rachel's story. Um, After her fall, and, you know, there, it got a lot of press locally, at least because of the tragedy that it was. Um, we were getting a lot of push, my husband and I, to prosecute the kids that were at that party for not, you know, calling 911 or, or being more attentive to Rachel. And I really feel like at the at the bottom of all this was a, a lack of understanding of what had happened, the seriousness of her injury. Um, and... I felt that what kids needed was education. They didn't need punishment. You know, it wasn't going to bring Rachel back, but we could save other children's lives, other teens' lives by focusing on Rachel's story and implementing change in how students respond to other students in need. And so that was Rachel's first week was born. 
Oh, well, it, it's such a remarkable uh, program. You're you're doing so much great work in this world, educating others about these um, these situations that can occur and what to do. And this is why bystander intervention is so important and, and, and combined with um, legal, you know, the laws that allow students to step forward without worrying about being prosecuted. And I think that's such an important thing for students to know. It's better just to call 911, get the seriously the help that is needed immediately and this is what can literally save a life and so i know what you're doing is is really critical now as we're talking about this what are specific challenges that high school seniors and college freshmen face um during their decision making uh transition into adulthood um part of it's what i call human evolution and it's just the fact that as these teenage brains mature and develop into adult brains um, there's this period of time where um, students feel like they're they're fearless they don't feel like any of these dangers apply to them it always happens to somebody else or um, they don't perceive the dangers they they perceive it as a fun challenge um, Interestingly, um, as we have identified students who have done the right thing and called for 911 or called for help when a student was in need, a lot of them don't want to be recognized for that. They, they are somewhat um, embarrassed, I guess, or they feel like it's not cool to be the person that called 911. So um, getting students to act is sometimes difficult just because of the repercussions that they get from their peers. Um, and I would say another problem we see in kids in this age group is that um, they're afraid of overreacting. They've never seen somebody fall down a stair and hit their head and get knocked out. Um, and so it doesn't occur to them that this is just as dangerous as getting shot in the chest with a gun. You just don't see the aftermath. And so, you know, we, we really work to um, to get kids to realize that, you know, these dangers exist and they are very, very serious. Right. And I think that's what we do at Global Secure Resources is focus on the three P's, proactive, prepared, and protected, making sure that people are learning these life skills. And they're new, like you like you mentioned, to these students, these are new circumstances. And and I, I've heard people who have, and students that have heard you speak, and they you know, light up with saying, I, I had no idea, this is so important, I'm going to do things differently. If I see something, I'm going to call for help. And that is where you're making a tremendous uh, change in this ecosystem of college and, and high school. So um, it's so amazing with, with what you're doing. So in your um, experience, what are some of the mis uh, misconceptions and blind spots for students as they're going off to college? Um, I, I usually I, talk about like the red zone, right? So yeah, that's red zone. We, I think it's kind of a universal yeah. descriptor of that period in a kid's development where they are transitioning to adulthood and it's where they're risk takers. And this is where we find the highest number of deaths due to accidents and deaths due to suicide and deaths due to falls. It's in that demographic. Um, so talking specifically about blindsidedness, um, I think, one of the big issues I'm encountering more and more lately are mixed messages. Kids are getting mixed messages about what's safe and what is not safe. For instance, in Indiana, our state is almost completely surrounded by other states who have legalized cannabis in one form or another. So it's okay in Michigan, but it's not okay in Indiana. Similarly, they may see their parents drinking in excess and being loud and boisterous, yet we tell them not to drink. We tell teens you know, that binge drinking is bad, whereas they witness it by people who are their mentors. So that's a real blind spot. And it's really difficult to turn those conceptions around um, into realizing that these are actually risk-taking behaviors. Yes, I, I agree with you. And right now we're seeing in the media that um, people are reconsidering that idea of, 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 how dangerous cannabis is. And I have recently read some articles about uh, Oregon that they're trying to reverse the laws um, where they have made it, uh, you know, some of these drug offenses um, with no consequences and, and really made these safe areas for consumption and it's not doing the community any good. So I, it's a, it's a tough place, but as long as we're doing this awareness and talking about the hazards and the harms, um, I, you know, this is how we can get in front of these little blind spots, I think. But like you say, that message is really difficult one when some of your mentors are partaking. It's, it, it is kind of tough, but 
I so I have a question for you. What have you had any like um, uh, success moments and impactful moments that you've seen through Rachel's first week that you'd like to share with us? Oh yeah, um, you know. All right, we can talk about this in a couple of different ways. We we do our program. One of our programs, we have multiple programs under the umbrella of Rachel's first week, but. One of our programs is a convocation type program where we bring the seniors of the high school and we, and we teach them about the five number or top five top uh, risks to uh, kids in this age group. And afterwards to have the kids come up to me and say, this really is going to change my life. This is really, I had no idea that, that, that this is a possibility. You know, when we talk about suicide, when we talk about sexual health, when we talk about um, drinking and knowing what you put in your body. Um, other stories that I hear are less frequent, and it's because they have taken the concepts we teach from Rachel's first week and Im implemented them, and nothing bad happened. So it's really hard to do outcome studies on something that didn't happen uh, because of an intervention that you made along the way. And that's one thing that we struggle with is how do we demonstrate to others, the importance of what we're doing and what others can do as well, you know, under the same type of, of uh, process of, of teaching kids during this dangerous time of their life. Yeah, I, I worked uh, many years on the Boston Area Rape Crisis Line, the hotline, the Community Awareness and Prevention Program, and also facilitating survivor speakers. And it's um, so important to have the resources and the, uh, the ability to really communicate with others about the harms and then where you can get these resources and services. And so I know Rachel's first week is doing a great job getting out there in front of people and, and really sharing this. Um, as a mom who's experienced a tragedy, losing your child to a preventable accident, how do you channel that, um, your personal experience into the work that you do for, for Rachel's first week? I would say that um, every grieving parent's experience is, is different. Um, a lot of parents are, have this, this grief energy is what I call it, where you're going to change the world and um, you channel all this energy into developing programs without really thinking through the implications of what you're start, trying to start. Um, for me, it, it was a little bit slower process. You know, I, I stewed on it for a while before I finally came up with the concept that ended up being Rachel's first week. Um I think it's important that somebody just decides their goal. What do they want to achieve out of the program that they start? And, and secondly, is that goal manageable? And one of the ways you can make it manageable is to do two things, right? A mission statement and a vision. And these are really quite difficult to write. They're usually one or two sentences, and they require you to really condense and distill down to its you know, finest point, what you want to accomplish. Um, and then as your program develops, you know, you reread that over and over again uh, as time progresses. Are you meeting what you really set out to meet? And I think if you take your time and really decide how you want to change whatever it is that you want to change, you know, how, how you're going to get to that end goal. For instance, I, I encountered a mother whose uh, child was uh who died from using designer drugs that were not illegal at the time. And so her mission was to get rid of all the designer drugs. So clearly noble ambition, way too lofty. And so, you know, after a while, those programs tend to fail because people have bitten off more than they can chew. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is just to surround you with self with good people, volunteers, people who share your passion. Right. Yeah. And how do you collaborate with schools and communities and other organizations to really expand your reach um, uh, and the impact of your program? So um, I would say that when I first started, I didn't do a very good job of it. Um, I went back to Rachel's High School and um, we did our first program there. Uh, it um, it turned out OK for really, you know, an inaugural program with not really knowing what I'm doing. Um, but one thing that we did was we we didn't charge for the program. So there were some expenses involved, you know, because we give out handouts and things to the kids after the program, but we didn't charge. We just sort of lived off of um, some donations that were made. Um, once the word kind of got out that, hey, we're the only gig in town that's 
focusing on this demographic and what we're doing. You know, once we got out, we got multiple schools that were interested in have us coming. So um, within a couple of years, we were even getting invites from all over the country to come and, and speak at their schools, you know, which was just not practical um, because of the fact the way we structure our program, we have emergency medicine doctors, residents, young doctors in training present our content. So it's just, you can't pluck four or five people out of the hospital and say, hey, we're going to go on a road trip for a couple of days and, and present this content to a school out of state. So clearly, you know, on my radar, on my vision, my mission statement is to somehow make this nationwide. But at this point in time, it's just not feasible. Yeah. Well, this is why it's great to do podcasts where we can reach so many different areas with the important, you know, advocacy message of what we can do for our students to keep them safer. So mm -hmm. what what lessons have you learned along the way that have been instrumental in your personal and professional growth as a safety advocate in this nonprofit space? <laughs> what lessons have I learned? Um I would say one of the lessons to learn is when you're developing a program, especially if you're not a program manager or developer, you know, just like me, I just take care of people in a hospital. I, you know, it was not my, my strength or my knowledge base, but at any rate, you tend to take these things very personal when they don't turn out the way you like If the, the program, you, the kids weren't as engaged as you would have hoped them to be, or, um, you know, you just, you just didn't get the response you wanted or something, some obstacle came up in the course of you getting ready to plan a program where they had to cancel or something like that. It's real easy to think, oh my goodness, I, I failed my child. I failed the program. And you can't do that. It's just part of running a program. Yeah. Um, and then you have to learn from those obstacles and how you circumvent them. So I was having a trouble, trouble with speakers sometimes that would have to cancel at the last minute because they were getting pulled into another clinical arena. And so I developed a method to make sure that I, my speakers never canceled at the last meeting at the last minute, because it's hard to put on a program when nobody talks. So um, but I, th I think that that has been, it. it's just trying to keep yourself organized, stay on task, stay on fo focus and, and not to take things personally. Those are some seriously great advice, <laughs> great pieces of advice. Now looking forward, what are your hopes and goals for the future of Rachel's first week? and the impact that it has on, on students. Well, funny you should say that. Um, I just landed yesterday from a trip to Florida where I met with a group in Alabama uh, and we're gonna see if we can take Rachel's first week nationwide, which I think I mentioned was sort of part of my vision. Um, I think it's real important that we develop relationships not only with other entities that share our passion, but also figure out ways to develop relationships with students as well. So um, we're working on that. And I think within the next year or two, you'll see Rachel's first week and hopefully most of the states in the union, maybe that's a little ambitious, but we'll focus on the Midwest and Southeast for right now. Oh my gosh, congratulations. I'm excited to see this growth. I'm so thrilled because, you know, our safety space, it's a large, but in some respects, it's very small. So to see you uh, grow in that direction just makes me so happy. So um, I, I, I guess I'd like to say, as we celebrate International Women's Day, what message would you like to share with young women about prioritizing their safety and well-being as they navigate through life's transitions and through life in general? Well, um, I think I would echo a lot of the things that you talk about in your programs, but I mean, I think life is very full of challenges. There's lots of periods of time where uh, things come and they, they blindside you, they knock you off track. Um, and these challenges can be tragic. Um, how you deal with these challenges becomes your currency for life as you get older and how you utilize what you learn from the tragedy or the success and, and incorporate it into your life. So, you know, you have to de develop a sort of risk tolerance. You have to decide how much you're willing to tolerate in terms of challenges and risks and then lead your life, you know, accordingly. Um, in race medicine, we always, motorsports medicine, we always talk about keep your head on a swivel. And I think that's pretty good advice. And our tagline for Rachel's first week is always look out for each other. So I think if you incorporate those two concepts, um, you'll get along just fine. So true. And that's one of the uh, areas that I focus on is really identifying your risk appetite. 
And another thing that I love to share with students is the ICE method, which is identify, calculate, and escape. These simple strategies and tools and techniques that we can share with students are so impactful. And so I guess in closing, I'm going to um, say thank you so much for joining me today. I want to ask all of my listeners to go visit Rachel's first week in the next 24 hours. Check it out and then send Rachel's first week link to a friend who is going to college or to a parent who is sending their children to college. Thank you so much. Your family has done so much to uh, empower and spread the awareness message to promote safe drinking interventions and to and and also the importance of intervening to keep your community safe. And I, I think uh, there's also a really important video that I would like our listeners to go and visit as well and watch. I think uh, every single student should watch this video. It's called Breathe, Nolan, Breathe. I'll make sure to put mm -hmm. that link yeah. in our, our description of our podcast. But... Um, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. You are an amazing woman changing the course of the world with your actions, your thoughts, and your hopes for a better, safer future. So once again, I will add the uh, information and links into the description, and we'll be back for another episode to increase public awareness to reduce the dangers faced by citizens in their daily life, whether traveling around the world or the corner. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button and follow. And we'll see you on our next podcast, The Savvy Safety Sisters. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Carrie. It's been an honor to chat with you.